Joe and Me, written and narrated by David Booty. When I look around the schoolyard at the other kids' parents, I can't help wondering if their lives could be any more different to ours. I see the same faces here day after day, all of them so absorbed in their individual problems and routines, never stopping to think about anything outside of their own little worlds. Sometimes I picture Joe in his class, talking with his friends about what jobs their parents do. One's dad might be a policeman, another a bus driver. Sally's mum is a lawyer, and Kyle's dad owns a store. I imagine the teacher going around the room asking each kid in turn. And then it gets to Joe, and the class falls silent. My dad stays at home, he tells them. But my mum's a brilliant scientist. She's going to save the world. The teacher tells him to stop telling lies, while the rest of the class piss themselves laughing. Thing is, though, it's true. Gillian Huxtable, my wife, Joe's mum, is doing exactly that. Joe appears in the doorway, almost the last one out as usual. He scans the yard, then catches my eye and runs over, weaving through the mass of other kids trying to get away from school. He might only be seven, but my little man looks so grown up. He digs deep into his rucksack and finds a carton of juice, then throws the bag at me and races off after one of his friends. He's waiting for me when I get down to the gate. He always is. You okay, Joe? You had a good day? Pretty good, he says, breathing hard from the run. So what did you do? Just stuff, he answers, shrugging his shoulders. And I know that's all I'm going to get. Doesn't matter, though. He's happy. I know he'd tell me if anything was wrong. We talk a lot, Joe and me. We stop at the store to pick up some food. I let him choose what we're having for dinner, then grab something else for Jill and me when he's not looking. Neither of us are that big on processed chicken bites. Joe disappears as soon as we get to the apartment. He does this every day after class. He calls it his me time, though Christ knows where he picked that phrase up from. I don't mind. Gives me a chance to cook before Jill gets back. She said she'd be home just after five. I delay dinner because Jill's usually late, but when it gets to half six, Joe and I eat. He's hungry. It's not fair to make him wait any longer. Where's Mum? he asks. She's gone to the circus. Really? No, just kidding. She's still at work. He shoves more chicken into his mouth. That's okay though, isn't it? he says, mouth too full. She's doing important stuff. She certainly is. And no one else can do it, can they, Dad? Not as far as I know. Your mum's a clever lady, one of the cleverest people I've met. She's far cleverer than me. But you're clever too, right, he says, concerned. Suppose I am. I passed all my exams. Mum took more exams than me, though. So you got beaten by a girl? Not beaten. It's not a competition. And anyway, it's not a girl, it's the girl. Your mum is truly gifted. And she's going to save the world? Well, that's what she keeps telling me, Joe. And if that's what she says, then that's what she'll do. So will we see more of her when she's done? I expect so. It's gone nine by the time Jill gets home. Joe tried to stay awake to see her, but he's spark out. She carefully opens the door and creeps into the apartment like a kid back late from a party they weren't supposed to go to. And the first thing she sees is me sitting there like a parent about to hit the roof. For a second she looks concerned. Sorry Simon, she says, kicking off her shoes and draping her coat over the back of a chair. It's all right, I tell her, and I mean it. She's under a huge amount of pressure right now. As long as she's okay, I don't care what time she comes home. There's a weight of expectation on her shoulders, and I can barely imagine how it must feel. You hungry? Starving. I get up and stretch, feeling guilty because I fell asleep in front of the TV just now. I warm her dinner in the microwave, pour her a glass of wine, then take it all through. She's waiting at the table, her head in her hands. Thank you. You had a good day, she asks. Fine. Is Joe okay? Yeah, he's okay. He tried to stay up, but he didn't make it. I didn't know I was going to be this late. You say that most nights. She smiles with resignation and, and reaches across and squeezes my hand. I know, love. I'm sorry. Tough day, then. You could say that. I can't seem to get it through to those dumb fuckers that if they want results, I've got to be left alone to get on with the work. Interrupting me every couple of days for progress reviews and demanding endless reports won't help anyone, you know? I know, but this is the military we're dealing with, don't forget. I don't know which are worse, she says. 
the morons in defence or the politicians. I hate them all the same. You get in there though, right? She nods her head and drinks more wine. I think so. They want everything de delivered yesterday. They don't seem to understand how long something like this takes. I can't work any faster, and I'm not working any more hours. There aren't any more hours left to work, I say. You know what I mean, Si. It would help if I wasn't surrounded by grunts all the time. If they thought more about the process and less about the end result, we'd probably have fewer arguments and we'd get there much quicker. You think they're getting annoyed because you're moonlighting? I'm not moonlighting, she says. You've got to stop saying that. OK, but you are using their funding and resources to develop something that's not for the military. It's a double-edged sword, you know it is. Same overall process, two very different applications. Try explaining that to your grunts. I have, she sighs, believe me. I can see why they might get pissed off, though. All that cash they've thrown your way, and you have the audacity to actually want to help people, not kill them. I stop talking when she puts down her fork and glares at me. Are you deliberately trying to wind me up? Yes, I say. Is it working? Beautifully. Good. I love it when you're angry. Have I ever told you how sexy I think you look in your lab coat? I wish you'd order me about the same way you do poor old Alfie. Don't even get me started on Alfie. He drives me to distraction. He's a stereotypical science nerd, you know? Great ability, fantastic qualifications, but no common sense. I don't know how he functions in the real world. Do you know what he did today? No, I tell her, and I don't want to. Finish your dinner, drink too much wine, then come to bed with me. It's hard to sleep when you haven't done a lot all day. I used to feel incredibly guilty, but I'm slowly getting used to it. It's just the way it has to be for now. It's late now and I can't sleep. I look across at Jill lying next to me. She was out the second her head hit the pillow. Things won't always be this way, but I know it has to be like this for now. You're a kept man, she teases me daily. Make the most of it. Enjoy it while it lasts. Joe loves coming to the lab. Jill was gone by the time he woke up this morning. When she called at lunchtime and told me it was going to be another late night, I decided to pick up the kid from school and bring him straight over here so we could all spend a little time together. The lab always reminds me of something out of a David Cronenberg movie. This downtown area is ripe for investment and redevelopment, and it looks like something's finally happening. There's a lot of construction traffic and signage around that wasn't here last week. It's about time. The building itself looks like little more than a dilapidated shelf from the outside, appearing almost on the verge of dereliction, and I guess that was half the appeal. You'd never suspect that anything with the potential to be world-changing could happen in a shithole like this. If you asked anyone where the major scientific developments would be made in this city, they'd all point you in the direction of the gleaming glass and metal spires at the high end of town. They couldn't be more wrong. Those places are filled with bankers and other people who think they're important but aren't. This is where the real advances are being made. We parked the car and I walked Joe down the dingy back alley to the building entrance, gripping his hand tight just in case. With tall blocks on either side, it's dark here even in daylight. The lobby of the building smells of piss, stale beer and other things I don't even want to think about. The lift's temperamental and Joe never feels safe in the rattling metal cage, so we take the stairs to the top floor. He runs on ahead, leaving me behind, carrying the pizza. I can hear his footsteps thumping on the steps, and occasionally I see a flicker of movement or a glimpse of his shadow, so I know he's okay. There's no one else here. Three of the four floors are empty, and there are pin codes and biometric codes and good old-fashioned traditional locks and bolts preventing unauthorised access. Jill can't afford to take any risks. The entire place can be locked down quicker than you can say, lock it down. Joe's waiting for me on the gloomy landing, leaning against the door, waiting for me to enter my pin. We go through, the four high-pitched bleeps and the clunk of the locking mechanism announcing our arrival. And here's where things change. Beyond this corridor and the next strengthened door is another world. The lab cost a small fortune to design and install, and no expense was spared. In effect, it's a hermetically sealed shell, which was dropped into the top floor of the existing building. Within it are office, living and meeting spaces, and two further, even more rigorously sealed inner units. Jill and Alfie sometimes have to handle seriously dangerous shit in there. They can't take any chances. 
second pin and a retina scan and we're almost inside. Light floods through the inch thick safety glass, spilling into the corridor. I saw your number, Joe says. You shouldn't have been looking. Don't tell mum. He laughs. Can you fix it so it takes pictures of my eye? He asks as I lean into the camera. You're too short, I tell him. You're only just tall enough to reach the handle. You need to grow first. He punches me and I push him through the door. Jill spots him straight away. Hey you, she shouts and he runs over. He jumps up and wraps his arms around her. I check the doors a lot behind me then go through, passing Alfie who's working at a desk strewn with papers. Good evening Simon, he says, glancing up from his computer screen for the briefest of moments. You right, Alfie? I'm fine thank you, he replies with his typical Vulcan-like lack of emotion. And that's it, conversation over. You okay to take a break, I ask Jill. She's already sitting on the sofa with Jill in the, Joe in the rest area. I take the pizza over and Joe dives in. How are things? You had a better day? Much better, she answers. No generals or bureaucrats to deal with today. Generals, Joe says, puzzled. Generals are soldiers, aren't they? Jill looks over at me before answering. Yeah, that's right, honey. Why soldiers? There are lots of people interested in what we're doing here. Yeah, I know that, Mum. But why soldiers? Sometimes Joe acts older than his years. Most kids would just accept there are soldiers involved somewhere along the line and leave it at that. Not our boy. He needs more. There are some nasty people in the world. You know that, don't you? Jill says. Of course I do. But what's that got to do with it? Can you remember what I've told you before about what we're doing here, Joe? Not really. A little bit, maybe. OK, so you know that when you get sick and you go to the doctor, what happens? I get time off school? That's not what Mum means, I interrupt, and Joe flashes me a quick grin. Medicine, he says. Exactly, says Jill. So right now, if you need medicine, the doctor can give you a pill or a capsule, maybe even a jab. I don't like needles. I know you don't. Joe continues to gorge on his pizza, as Jill explains. You know how you sometimes hear about diseases going crazy? It happens in other countries, usually. Pandemics. Have you heard that word? Don't think so. Well, you remember last year, when half your class was off with a cold at the same time? I remember. Well, a pandemic is like that, but much, much worse. Lots of people getting really sick at the same time. And sometimes the reason that happens is because we can't get enough medicine to enough people, she explains, either because it's too expensive or too dangerous. So what we're doing here is trying to find a way of giving those people their medicine and making them better without having to give them pills or shots. Does that make sense? I think so, he says. But how else can you give it to them? In the air, she explains. That's what we're trying to do. We're just going to pump it into the sky so it can make everyone better at once. Joe chews on his pizza and nods thoughtfully. Your mum's pretty smart, isn't she? Alfie says, finally coming over and helping himself to a slice. Joe nods. I still don't get why there were soldiers here, though. Jill looks over at me again. How much do we tell him? How much does he need to know? The world can be a rough place at times, son, I say. People fall out and start fighting. Don't patronise me, Dad. I know about wars. Never mind now. When did you find out what patronise means? Jill takes over. So our soldiers try not to start these fights, but they have to do what they can to look after people like us, don't they? He thinks about what she said. So they want what you're making so they can spread bad medicine. Is that it, Mum? To sort out all the bad people who start all the fights? That's one option, Alfie says, with his typical lack of tact. Jill jumps in quick. Sometimes bad people try to use diseases to make innocent people sick. They're terrorists, Joe. You've heard that word, right? So what we're doing is making something that'll stop those germs from working. Kind of like a shield. It'll stop the bad stuff getting through. You understand? I think so. Sure? Yep. I need to pee. With that, he jumps up and disappears into just about the only other room he can get into here without a pin code or military-level clearance. You think he's okay with all of that? I asked Jill. Joe's a smart kid. You can tell when someone's avoiding answering his questions. I reckon it's best to tell him straight. You realise he'll probably talk at school? 
and I'll get him to sign a non-disclosure form, she says. I'm serious. Oh, so what if he does? To be honest, Si, I bet he already has. Thing is, no one's going to believe him. He could give them the address of this place and it wouldn't matter. Anyone coming here would take one look and think he was making it all up. She looks up as Joe comes running back over and reaches for another slice of pizza. Do you wash your hands, son? Yes, he says, though he probably hasn't. Jill pulls him close and holds him tight. Enough about my boring work, anyway. What have you been up to today, sunshine? I drop Joe off at school first thing, then run a few mundane errands, trying to avoid going back home because I know there's equally mundane stuff waiting there that I don't want to do. I missed a call from Jill while I was out filling the car. I'm in the neighbourhood, so I drive over to the lab to see her. There's a car I don't recognise parked in the alleyway next to Jill and Alfie's. Unusual plates, dark windows, sinister looking. Who the hell's this? Some stuffed suit demands when I get upstairs and let myself into the lobby area of the lab. This is my husband Simon, Jill tells him. She looks flustered and angry. What, and he has full access to your research and facilities, the suit continues, talking about me as if I'm not here. No, though he does have some limited access, she tries to explain. Simon sometimes helps with processing and data entry, and occasionally he transcribes my notes. It's all authorised. He has the right clearance level and he's been background checked. Does the General know about this? Well, I haven't made a point of telling him, but he appreciates we need some level of administrative support. Look, Simon and I have a son. Simon looks after him so I can work full time. I'm here all hours, so it just wouldn't be feasible not to allow it. I'm not happy about this, he interrupts. I'm conscious that I'm standing in the middle of this discussion like a spare prick at a wedding. I offer the guy my hand, but he doesn't react. This is Mr Jenkins, Jill says, one of General Nicholls' team. He was just leaving. That explains it. I'm starting to think I shouldn't have come here. Maybe that was why Jill called, to tell me to stay away. I should have checked first. I'll get out of the way. Even from the living space on the other side of the lab, I can still hear everything. Jenkins' voice is naturally loud, and Jill is clearly exasperated. I try to talk to Alfie, but he stays focused on his work, not wanting to get involved. This is just symptomatic of the kind of issues we're having with your approach here, Jenkins says. But does it matter? If you're getting results, then... But we're not getting results, are we? He interrupts. We're just a few months away from finishing this now, Jenkins, Jill says. Years of progress, and it's just a matter of weeks before we can give you everything you want. Save your breath, Dr Huxtable. We've been through this before. You know our position now. We'll talk again tomorrow when you've had time to consider the options. And with that, he's gone. Jill walks him down to his car. I watch from the window as he disappears, then wait for her to return. She seems to take forever coming back up to the top floor. So what was all that about? I ask. They're shutting us down, she says, in tears. They're pulling our funding. We're so close, Simon. But it's not good enough for them. They think they've got enough experience and data to take the project on in-house. So what are you going to do? She slumps down into the nearest chair. How much of that did you hear? Not much. They've given me an ultimatum. I can walk away from all of this, or I can go and work for the General on his terms. It's not much of a choice, really. You didn't answer my question. Those are the options they've given you. But what are you going to do? What do you want to do? I ask. I can't go and work for the military, side. I just can't. The second I sell out and jump in bed with them exclusively is the second the rest of my research dies. The vaccination applications, the humanitarian aspects of what we're doing here, all that will be forgotten. Oh sure, they'll tell me otherwise to keep me sweet, but we both know it'll happen. I can't turn my back on what we've been doing here, Simon. You know I can't. But you knew this was going to happen eventually. We were so close, though. So what happens next? I ask her. She sighs and looks up at the ceiling. Look, I've only been able to keep working because the military were bankrolling us. Without their cash, I'm screwed. I mean, they'll give me a payoff, and as long as they've got the research, Jenkins says they'll negotiate on these premises, let me stay a while longer. So do that, then. How much longer do you need? How long's a piece of string? Well, you know, give me a clue. Are we talking weeks? Months? Years? She thinks for a second. 
Six months maybe, a year at the outside. And do you think we can do it? Can we afford it with what they're giving you? No way. I've got maybe a third of what I need. But what if I go back to work? Then there's the equity in the apartment. It's a a possibility. I think carefully before I ask my next question, because I'm not sure how she's going to take it. Are you completely sure you can't work with them? I mean, you've been working on your stuff without them knowing since you started here. Couldn't you just carry on? She shakes her head. It's not that simple. The general's made it very clear that I'd be part of a team under his direct command. I get the impression I'd have to account for every second of my time. I just know I wouldn't be able to work on anything but the military applications of the project. And you're completely sure about that? Jill doesn't answer. She gets up and starts pacing the room, tears flooding down her face now. I move towards her but she pushes me away, not wanting to be touched. Why can't they see, she sobs. My work has the potential to save thousands of lives, millions even. But they're not interested. Profit and politics comes first. They're too busy starting wars to realise how pointless what they're doing really is. You're never going to change them. You know that. It's a mindset. It's why the fuckers with all the guns keep telling us they work for the Department of Defence. Bastards. I can't do it, Si, she says finally relenting and reaching out for me. I hold her tight, her body rocking in my arms as she sobs. I can't turn my back on my research. I just can't. I couldn't live with myself if I don't see it through. Then don't. Tell them to stick their job and keep working here. We'll find a way. Considering the economic environment, finding work was pretty easy. So far it's mostly been cleaning, bar work or flipping burgers alongside people half my age. But they all pay and I've been able to juggle the jobs around Joe. Selling the apartment has given us a temporary financial cushion, but it also seems to have increased the pressure on Jill. It's been a struggle since we moved into the cramped living quarters of the lab. More than that, she knows that once the money from the apartment's gone, that's it. We've nothing else to fall back on. At least Joe gets to see more of his mum now. Shame the three of us don't get to spend as much family time together as we'd like. The novelty's definitely worn off, and Joe gets left alone in front of the TV more than either of us would like. But I keep telling myself this is only temporary. It's been almost three months now. It'll all be worth it when Jill gets to present her research. She had to let Alfie go. Truth be told, that was probably a good thing, and it was partly my suggestion. This place is our home now, and it didn't feel appropriate having him around so much. To be honest, I think he was glad to leave. We made it easy for him, and he hinted he had something else lined up. It means I've been having to take up up some of the slack, of course. I feel like a glorified secretary a lot of the time, typing up Jill's notes and helping her document her progress. Things are different when I look around the schoolyard now. Now I feel like the rest of the parents, tired and irritable, struggling to make ends meet, Of course, if the teacher went around the class and asked, Joe would still tell them his mum's busy saving the world. I don't know how how much of what's going on he's picked up. He's a bright kid, though. He knows we're stressing, and he also knows that sleeping on a camp bed next to your parents on the floor of a science lab isn't how most kids his age spend their time. Hey, Dad, he shouts as he runs over, pushing his way through the crowds. Hey, you. I grab his hand and take his bag. Where are we going? he asks. Home. What, you mean the lab? Can't we go somewhere else? Like where? The park. Please, Dad. Believe me, Joe, there's nothing I'd rather do. Sorry, though, son. Not tonight. Why not? Because I've got work. Again. Yes, again. But you're always at work. Or at least it means you get to spend more time with your mum. He thinks for a second. I'd rather spend time with you. Don't say that, Joe. Do you have any idea how much Mum loves you? No. She's always working. She doesn't talk to me. We stop walking and I crouch down so that I'm at Joe's eye level. Don't talk like that, sunshine. Mum and I love you more than anything else in the world. I know you do, he says. Mum does too. She doesn't show it. I hate it when you're not there, Dad. It's like I don't matter. 
She's always tired and cross. When I ask her to do stuff with me, she just gets mad and shouts. Then she gets upset when I get upset. I don't like it. Look, I'll talk to her. We stay staring at each other for a few seconds longer. So what do you want for dinner, champ? He shrugs his shoulders. Burger, maybe? Burger it is. I grab his hand and cross the road to get to the nearest place. Giving my son a treat is the very least I can do. I'm going to spend most of the evening flipping burgers for other people. So why shouldn't Joe get one too? It's late when I get back, but Jill's still working. I was hoping she'd have stopped and spent time with Joe, but I know she hasn't. She barely looks up when I say hello. I strip and shower, then make us both some coffee. Thanks, she mumbles, barely lifting her eyes from the computer screen. We need to talk, I tell her. What about? About Joe. About us. I've been dreading this all night. At least now she's listening. She takes off her glasses and rubs her eyes. I knew this was coming. Doesn't that just make it worse? She's still distracted by the numbers on the screen. I switch the monitor off and she slumps back. Jill, stop. Listen. I am listening. I was talking to Joe before work. He's struggling, you know. Yeah, I'm struggling too. Yeah, but you're 32. He's eight. Did you talk to him tonight? I didn't see much of him, she says. Yeah, is that because he wasn't in here or because you were too busy to look? Both. Shit, I don't know. What am I supposed to do, Si? I can't stop working. We don't know how long we've got left before the money runs out. And if I stop now, it will all have been for nothing. I can't give up on this. You know what's at stake. Yeah, I know, I know. Believe me, Jill, I know exactly where you're coming from. So what are you asking me to do? Make a choice? No. Yes. Oh, Christ, I'm not sure. Something's got to change, that's all I know. Joe's our responsibility. He should be our priority. It's not that simple, she says. There's an awkward silence. It goes on too long. I sense she wants to get back to work, but it's late. It's too late. Come to bed, Jill. She reluctantly gets up and I hold her. At first she just stands there, then slowly she melts. I'm sorry, she whispers. Don't be, I tell her, feeling bad. It's not your fault. It's an impossible situation. We all know how important what you're doing is. Yeah, but I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place, she says. I'm damned if I don't, I'm damned if I do. It's not as bad as you're making it sound, isn't it? Well, from where I'm standing, it looks exactly like that. From here, my ultimate choice looks simple. I have to choose between my son and everyone else. You're asking me to to make an impossible decision. Some days it's hard fitting everything in. Other days it's a breeze. Thankfully, today is one of those days. I drop Joe at school first thing, then work the cleaning job through until early afternoon. That's me done for the day now. I've got a night off, and I'm going to convince Jill to take a break too. I have to slam on the brakes and give way when a car races out of the mouth of the alleyway alongside the lab. Wait... Was that Alfie? He's gone too fast for me to see, but I asked Jill as soon as I got upstairs, get up to the top floor. Yep, it was Alfie. What did he want? He wanted to confess his sins. A little bastard jumped straight out out of here and into bed with the General and Jenkins, didn't he? He thought he might. Yeah, but I hoped he wouldn't. Something's not right here. Something's seriously wrong. Jill's seething. So what's happened? She sweeps her arm across the desk in rage, sending papers flying, then kicks her chair across the lab. She thumps the wall and manages to to trigger the containment protocol in her fit of temper. She panics when she realises what she's done, but she's too angry to think straight. Warning lights flash and the alarm starts to sound. The secure doors slide shut and bolt themselves, and air hisses, sealing off one of the inner labs. She shuts it all off quickly enough thumping her pin into that override keypad, then leaning against the panel so the system can scan her retina. She leans against the wall as everything slowly resets, breathing hard. Talk to me, Jill. She's still too angry to talk at first. Then, 
Finally, she speaks. Alfie came to tell me he'd walked out in protest. The fucking idiots have launched. Launched? Launched what? What do you think? The military have triggered the ADP. ADP? Look, sorry, Jill, I don't follow. Airborne Defence Programme. That's what they're calling it now. And does it really matter? They beat you to it, I say. So what? You can just keep working on your research and then... But they haven't fully tested it, she interrupts. They haven't had time. Alfie's no fool. He tried to warn them, but they still went ahead and did it. It's early days, though. Can't you just... I can tell from your expression that I need to shut up. It's self-replicating, Simon. They've engineered a variant that's self-replicating. Jesus, in a couple of days it'll have spread everywhere. It'll be all over the fucking planet. And would it work? Probably. Alfie seems confident anyway. But you knew they'd do this eventually. You're missing the point, Simon. Everybody will be breathing their stuff in. It means all my work is wasted now. None of it's worth a damn anymore. I don't understand. Well, how can that be? Don't you see? Christ, Simon, just think about it. The stuff they've pumped into the air is based on pretty much the exact same principles as my airborne vaccinations. By the time I'm ready to go public, the ADP will have such a hold it will neutralise the vaccines before they've even had a chance to start working. I'm fucked. They have total control over the air we breathe. All of this was for nothing. This stuff was Gillian's life work. But it wasn't her life, and I needed to see that. I think we'd both lost sight of what matters and had let everything get out of balance. In a strange way, I thought the loss of her research might help us get things back on track. I convinced her to take some time away from it all, that maybe things weren't as bad as they looked. Whether she genuinely agreed with what I was saying, or just wanted to shut me up, she left the lab and came with me to get Joe from school. Once I'd got her away, I said we should make a night of it. She instinctively found a hundred and one reasons why she shouldn't, but I wasn't listening. It'll all look different once you've taken a step back, I told her. The expression on Joe's face when he pushed his way out through school doors was priceless. I couldn't remember the last time we picked him up after class together. Come to think of it, apart from sleeping, I struggled to think of anything much we'd done together as a family for months. We've been out for a couple of hours now, and Jill seems a little more relaxed. We walk home together through the park, taking the long route back to the lab. Joe runs on ahead, kicking through the first fallen leaves of early autumn. Money's not an issue, I tell her. Seriously, I know it's been tight, but once the lab's been broken up, we'll be back on an even keel again. Only take us a couple of years to get ourselves where we were. Who said anything about breaking up the lab, she says. Well, I just assumed. You assume what? That I'd just roll over? That I'd give up on all that work without a fight? No. I assumed you'd be ready to move on. That you'd come back to your family. We need you, Jill. She stops walking and I stop too. Joe looks back, a huge smile on his face. I see her shoulders slump. OK, you're probably right. I've got a few loose ends to tie up first, though. That's cool. Do you remember Grant Jefferson? I think so, I say. I don't, but I tell her I do just to keep the conversation moving. I spoke to him last week. He said there's a teaching position at the university if I want it. That sounds good. We walk again, taking a pathway which branches right and runs between two football pitches. There's a junior match in progress on one of the pitches. We walk behind a row of parents, all screaming encouragement at their kids. Joe stops to watch. Do you want to play football one day? I ask him. Sure, he says, before running off again. This could be us, I say to Jill. This should be us. We should be enjoying our time together. Enjoying our son. He's taken second place for far too long. I know, she says. But you've got to believe me. It's not because I didn't want to be with him. I love him more than I can tell you. It's, it's just that... Just what? It's just the responsibility. You know, I thought I was doing something that would make a real difference. Christ, how naive was I? 
Not naive, I tell her, just honest, genuine. She takes my hand. First time she's done that in ages. But it really hurt, Simon. And I don't think you can understand how much. I had such an incredible opportunity. A chance in a lifetime to make things better. And it's all gone so horribly wrong. All I've done is help create something that's put everyone at risk. You, me and Joe included. We're probably breathing it in right now. Our son's lungs are probably full of the manufactured shit that I helped to create. Some things are bigger than us, Jill. I hate to say it, but it's true. Since they first heard about what you were doing, it's been you on your own against the whole damn government. What hope did you really have? You're a person with feelings and emotions. You're a wife, a mother, a daughter. Them? Well, they're just power-hungry, emotionless bastards. It's time to forget about the rest of the world and focus on us. Focus on Joe and me. You're right, she says, wiping a tear from her eye, thinking I haven't noticed. We're just little cogs in an overcomplicated machine that's going nowhere. I was stupid to think any different. So you're going to take a break from all of this? I'll take a break, she says reluctantly. Like I said, just let me have a few days to tidy up the loose ends. Jill picked up through the course of the evening. Her mood steadily lifted, and she once again became the woman I fell in love with and married, not the high-profile, world-changing scientist she'd been over the last couple of years. It was good to have her back. Joe settled quickly once we got back to the lab. Once he was asleep, Jill and I drank wine and fucked on the floor, exploring each other's bodies with a ferocious excitement I'd started to think we'd lost forever. On Sunday, Joe got sick. It was just a 24-hour stomach bug which had been working its way through his class. Nothing more serious. He asked his mum if he could use some of her air medicine to help him feel better, then spent most of the day either throwing up or sitting on the toilet. We've kept him home today, just to let him get it out of his system. He's keeping Jill company as she starts packing stuff away. It's just another day at the office for me, though. The cleaning job first, then onto the burger bar around noon. Days like this are going to be few and far between soon. Once things are back on track, I'll be able to cut down. We'll find ourselves a new place and settle down again. I spoke to Jill on my way between jobs to check how Joe was doing. She sounded genuinely happy. I think a major part of it is relief now she's severed her ties with the military. She was even talking positively about her research again. She says she thinks she might still be able to adapt the vaccination dispersal technology. To be honest, I don't care. As long as she's okay, that's all that matters. The burger job turned into a double shift when one of the stupid kids who worked there called in sick. It's late now, and dark. I can see the lights of the lab even from a distance. The other buildings in the neighbourhood are in darkness, and the top floor of our building stands out against the gloom of everything else. We definitely need to get away from here. I pass the construction site and wonder how long it will be before they come knocking at our door to pull the place down. That will force Jill's hand, if nothing else. I park the car and jog to the door. The dark place tricks on me here and makes me feel nervous. I'm thankful for the layers of security which keep the lab isolated from everywhere else. I check no one's watching and slip inside. I'm getting paranoid, I'm sure I am. I've been thinking all kinds of stupid thoughts all afternoon. It's only now she's stepped away from them that I've realised what a risk Jill was taking by continuing her humanitarian research while she was working for the military. They could make things really unpleasant for her, for us. It wouldn't take much to seriously piss off the wrong people and make enemies of those she reluctantly accepted as friends. All they'd need to do is dig up something on one of us in our student days, one of the many rallies we went on, the marches against capitalism and corporate greed. A few words to the people in the know, Maybe a cash bung to someone who used to be close. And before you know it, Jill's a terrorist. A threat to national security. No longer the future Nobel winner, I still believe she is. She's been walking a fine line. I want her away from all of this. The heavy door swings open and shuts behind me, blocking out the last of the traffic and city noise. In its place is the familiar quiet of this old building. The creaks and groans. The low machine hum coming from the top floor. It would be quicker to walk, but I'm tired, and I call the lift. 
I wait for it to work its way down to ground level, then get inside and slide the metal lattice doors across. It judders into life again and I lean back, thinking of bed. It's been a long day. Hopefully tomorrow will be quieter. I step out onto the landing, then stop. It's dark here. Darker than it should be. The corridor's too quiet. I enter my pin, scan my eye, and let myself in. Then stand in the small lobby area. There are fewer lights on in the lab than usual. Is something wrong with Joe? That seems a far more likely explanation than Jill having switched everything off to get an early night. I can hear the TV, I think. Jill! Joe! Where are you? I head straight for the cramped living area we've claimed as a home, flicking on more lights as I go. The TV's on, but neither Jill or Joe are there. I go further into the lab, and as I approach the main area, it immediately becomes clear what's happened. Jesus. One of the inner labs has sealed itself off. Shit, Jill must have tripped it. It's always been oversensitive. Damn, I bet that's exactly what's happened. The containment protocol has triggered and they're both stuck inside. I go to the small window and look in but I can't see either of them. I wrap my knuckles on the glass but it's too thick and heavy and, and they can't hear me. Stay calm, I tell myself. I can deal with this. I sit down at the control desk, trying to remember the logon details Jill gave me for when I helped to document her work. I shake the mouse and tap the spacebar and a terminal immediately comes to life. Jill's still logged in. There are windows open all over the screen. I can't make sense of most of them. Between this computer and the next is the mic I've seen Jill and Alfie use to talk to each other when one of them is working in the inner lab. I drag it over, press the button on the base, then cough, not wanting to startle Jill or Joe. Then I speak, and I could hear my muffled voice amplified inside the lab. Jill. Jill, are you in there? There's no answer. I try again, but there's still nothing. Don't panic. I can sort this out. We've talked about this kind of thing happening before. She showed me where to find the emergency instructions and troubleshooting guides. I tell myself over and over that it's just a system fault or just a malfunction, something like that. There are CCTV cameras controlled by another computer. I fluff my password twice, then manage to get in on my third attempt. The dark screen flickers into life. The display is split into quarters here, different CCTV images of what's happening inside both of the inner labs. I scan each of the pictures, and in the lowest corner of the bottom right image, I see her. Oh Christ, it's Jill. She's sprawled across the floor. She's not moving. I get up and run to the glass again and strain to see more. I can see one of her feet sticking out at an awkward angle to the rest of her body. Oh, what the hell happened here? Some kind of accident? I hammer on the glass, but I know it won't do any good. My hands are shaking with nerves as I sit back down at the keyboard and try to sort out this mess and get into that lab to help my wife. I find the camera controls and manage to zoom in on her face. The black and white images are pixelated, hard to make out. Wait, is that blood? I click the intercom button again. Jill! Answer me, Jill! The static hiss of an empty channel. No reply. Then finally I hear something. Daddy? Joe's voice sounds huge through the loudspeakers. I cycle through the CCTV images again, desperately looking for him. Where are you, sunshine? Come to the window. Then I see him. He's been hiding in a corner behind a cabinet, and he only becomes visible when he starts to move. He stands up slowly, then runs across the room, giving his mum as wide a berth as possible and knocking over a tray of instruments which fill everywhere with ugly, distorted noise. I look up as he slams against the glass, face ashen white with terror, standing on tiptoes so he can see over the sill. I carry the mic over to the window. Joe's hammering against it now, tears rolling down his cheeks. What happened, Joe? His amplified voice fills the room. All the doors locked on us, Daddy. I couldn't get out. What about Mommy? What happened to Mom? Did she have an accident? 
Can you try and get her to talk to me? His whole body judders as he sobs. He gives his mum a sideways glance, but he can't bring himself to look straight at her. She's not moving, Daddy. The door's all shut, and she couldn't get him open again. And she got angry, and she started shouting at me to get out of the way. She was on the computer. She was trying to make something happen, and then... What, Joe? What happened? She started coughing, Dad. It got really bad, really quick. I didn't know what to do. She started bleeding and she was sick. She threw up blood on the floor, Daddy. My mouth's gone dry. I can't think what to say. She's dead. I know already that I've lost her. I've got to get in there. I've got to get Joe out. I've got to get help. Daddy, can you get me out? Please, Daddy. I'm going to go and find out how. Give me a second, I tell him. I press my hand against the glass, as close as I can get to his, then go back to the desk. I start scanning the screens and menus, looking for the release to get him out of the inner lab. There's nothing obvious, no instructions. Jesus, there must be something. I remember Jill used to use a pin, and then a retina scan, and... Oh, shit. Wait. It hits me like a hammer blow. Why did the lab go into lockdown? Christ, what went wrong in there? Joe's crying over the loudspeaker, and the noise makes it impossible to think straight. He's still straining to look over the bottom of the window. Wait a sec, sunshine, I say, trying to keep myself together and not let him pick up on my nerves. I'll have you out of there in no time. I nudge the sound down to concentrate. I have to try and focus. I go back to the terminal that Jill's logged into so I can access her notes and recordings the way I did when I used to transcribe them for her. I compare the files and times on one screen with the camera feeds on another, then reverse the recordings. And for a few seconds I'm frozen, watching my wife come back to life as the footage runs backwards in double time. I spool back to just before she gets ill, then go back a little further still. I can only bear to watch a few seconds before I have to switch it off. I can hear her choking. She grabs her throat. She's trying to speak, but her noise is drowned out by Joe's terrified screams. Almost there, Joe, I tell him, glancing up at his saucer-like eyes, staring at me in abject terror. Won't be long, buddy, OK? Rewind again. Watch again. What was she doing? She was supposed to be disassembling the lab but she looks like she was still working on stuff. I've gone back several hours on the camera now. Jill's sitting at a workstation in the inner lab. Joe's lying on the floor next to her, reading a book. Everything looks pretty normal. And then I find her corresponding log entries, and I play the file. Her voice fills the room. 4.03pm. My analysis of the ADP is complete. As usual, Military Science Division have fucked things up. See, this is one of the reasons I couldn't work with them. They've tried to run before they could walk, and they've overlooked a couple of major flaws. Makes me glad I got rid of Alfie. He should have spotted this. I can't leave this project as it is. I can't leave the entire world breathing in this military-grade shite day after day. I can't have it on my conscience. I left myself a way out, and it's time to use it. There's a way to alter the structure of the ADP at base level. If it still works, it'll neutralise itself, see itself as a threat almost. The self-replication traits the military strapped on means that a chain reaction should then take place. In effect, if I've got this right, the ADP will eliminate itself and we'll be back to square one. It's a safeguard I had in place from the very beginning. My God, I think. Is that what happened? That would explain it. She did what she thought she had to do to eradicate the program, only for it to react. She used to talk about it as if it was intelligent sometimes. She said it could adapt, that it would target hostile germs. Another loud sob from Joe focuses me again. I was fast forward to CCTV, watching Jill move around the lab at double speed. She dashes around the place, stepping over Joe, who lies stationary on the floor under her feet. Then he gets up and he's sick everywhere. I thought he would have got rid of that bug by now. Jill stops what she's doing to clean him up. And for a moment, 
All I want to do is watch the two of them together. A mum and her son. Not a scientist. A mother. She sits him on a chair, ruffles his hair and fetches him a bowl. Fast forward. They're laughing again now. Both of them look pretty calm and relaxed. Fast forward. 5.25pm, Jill's voice says. Perfect. I took an air sample contaminated with ADP and added my re-engineered variant and the results have been exactly as I'd expected. Gradual ADP decay. I'm damn good. After 15 minutes, the sample showed hardly any trace of ADP remaining. Kiss this, General Nichols. Wish I could see the old bastard's face when they tell him his new peacekeeper has disappeared. Jill leaves the lab, then returns a short while later with a cup of coffee. Fast forward again. Stop. There's a sudden change. On the screen, Jill's up again, checking computers, moving frantically from terminal to terminal in the lab. I pause the film and check her login again, desperately scrolling through the entries to match the time with the CCTV footage. Got it. 6.13pm. Something's not right now. Shit, something's very wrong here. The two strains of the ADP appear to both to be reacting with something, but I, I don't know what, because there's a third element in here. They're combining. They're mutating. Oh, Christ, it's Joe. It's his sickness bug. The voice recording ends. Back to the CCTV. Jill bundles Joe up in her arms. But before she can get him out of the room, the lab locks itself down. The camera shakes with the force of the doors double locking themselves. On the camera, Jill drops Joe, then clutches at her throat. Daddy, get me out, Jill, Joe says, his amplified voice echoing around me. I can't take my eyes off the screen. Jill's on the floor now, thrashing helplessly, unable to breathe. And then she stops. Daddy! Joe screams again. The desperation in his voice is clear. His cries force me into action. I'll get you out, I'll tell him, wiping tears from my eyes, then pressing my hand against the glass, covering his. I try the door overrides, but they won't respond. The status manager says there's been a breach, that the lab can't be reopened until it's been decontaminated. I don't know how to reset the system. I'll have to break in. Look, I'm, I'm going to go and get some tools, Joe. I won't be long. I'll get you out, son, I promise. I take the lift down to the basement, the sound of Joe's sobbing still echoing in my ears. I run over to the construction site, desperately looking for anything I can use to smash my way into the lab. There's a van parked out of the way, as if someone was trying to hide it. I break a window and manage to scramble into the back, its triggered alarm deafening me. In it I find a pick and a lump hammer. I take them both and run back to our building. The lift cage rattles and judders as it climbs back up, and as it slowly approaches the top floor, all I can do is lean against the wall and think about Joe and Jill. The initial panic starts to fade slightly, and I start to consider my options with a fraction more clarity. Should I contact the military? I dismiss that idea almost before I've finished thinking it. I can't take that risk. Who knows what they'd do? If whatever's in there killed Jill, then they'll take Joe and run tests on him. Lock him up in another lab, and I won't be able to do anything to help. I can't let them. I could try Alfie, but I don't trust him either. I know I've got to do this by myself. The lift stops, and I slide back the door. I stop when I'm halfway along the corridor. Jesus Christ. A sudden realisation makes my legs go weak with nerves. Jill was talking about whatever it is that's loose in that lab, being self-replicating. Fuck. Can I risk breaching the seal and letting it out? Daddy, get me out! Joe starts screaming again the moment he sees me. How are you feeling, son? I'm scared, I'm really scared. Do you still feel sick? My voice is deliberately light, but it's not working. A little bit. I need to pee. 
Use the sink, I tell him. I can't. Just do it, Joe. I watch helplessly as he walks back across the lab, occasionally checking back over his shoulder to make sure I'm still there. He drags a stool over to the sink, then kneels on it and pees into the sink like I told him. He tries to wash his hands, but the water's dried to a dribble. Everything's shut down in there. Joe looks tired. He comes back over to the window, dragging his feet. Are you okay, son? I'm really hot. I'm really tired. Sit by the air vent. He does as I tell him, and holds his hand up against it. Nothing coming out, Daddy. My worst fears are confirmed. The inner labs are hermetically sealed rooms. Nothing's getting in or out. There's no air in there. Total lockdown. Joe's distracted, staring at his mum's corpse again. Don't look, son. I'm scared, Daddy. Get me out. Please, Daddy, get me out. Whatever it is that killed Jill, it hasn't affected Joe. So is it over? Or is he somehow immune? It's late. I've gone through all of Jill's files and all the manuals and system guides I can find, but I've found no answers. I can't make sense of any of the data, but then again I, I don't need to. All I know is my wife is dead and my son is trapped. And if I let Joe out, there's a chance more people might die. But what else can I do? It's my responsibility. I'm all he has left now. I remember Jill's words from a few nights back. She was talking about having to make an impossible decision, having to choose between our son and everyone else. And now I find myself facing the exact same choice. And for the first time, I can fully feel the enormous weight of pressure Jill had been struggling with all this time. I'm standing at the window again. Joe's sitting on the floor next to his mum. He stopped crying. He looks like he's struggling to stay awake. With effort, he glances up and sees me at the window, his eyes locking onto mine. What do I do? I can't let him die. I put on a face mask from one of the hazmat suits Jill and Alfie sometimes wore, then grab the pick and start swinging it at the wall. The windows and doors are strengthened. My best bet is to try and hammer my way straight through the brickwork. In a momentary gap between blows, I hear a little voice. Is that you, Daddy? It's Joe. It's just a whisper now. He's barely alive. You stay right back, sunshine, I shout, my voice muffled by the mask, not knowing if he can hear me. The plaster crumbles, wood starts to splinter, bricks shift. My muscles are already burning with effort, but I can't stop until I've got him in my arms again. I'm coming to get you, son. Where are we going, Dad? Away from here. I'm going to try and take you to Pop's house, OK? OK. Are we going to keep these masks on all day? Just for a little while. Just until we're sure it's safe. What about when we need something to eat? I'll think of something. What about Mum? That's hard to answer. It hurts too much. When you're safe with Pop, I'll come back and I'll look after Mum. What do you mean, look after her? I'll tell people about the accident. I'll, I'll tell people what happened. Are you going to get in trouble, Daddy? No, Joe. It'll all be fine. I start the car and drive away from the lab. The side roads are clear, but the traffic's backed up on Main Street. We can't go any further. Oh, it's the middle of the night, for Christ's sake. What's going on here? What's wrong? Joe, Joe asks. I think it's a crash. Just wait here. I get out of the car and pull my hood over my face so people don't get freaked out by the mask I'm still wearing. Looks like a car's gone into a hydrant up ahead. Jesus, is that someone lying in the middle of the road? And now I see that most of the other cars in this traffic queue have crashed too. 
It's like they've just run into each other. What the fuck's going on? I walk a little further forward and then I stop when the guy behind the wheel of the car I'm next to thumps his window. He's hammering on the glass like Joe did earlier. I pull him out and try to help him but there's, there's nothing I can do. He's choking. He writhes at my feet. He coughs and spits out blood all over my boots. And everywhere I look, more people are collapsing now. Everywhere. They're all dying like Jill. It's spreading. I have to get Joe away from here. I manage to turn the car around and we find another route out of town. What's happening, Dad? Joe asks, strapped into his booster seat behind me. I don't know. Those people were getting sick just like Mum did. I know, son, uh, and that's why we've got to keep our masks on. Shouldn't we help them? I don't think we can. I put my foot down and drive out of town. And now ours is the only car moving. I look at Joe in the mirror and I picture him still trapped in the lab with Jill, waiting to die. I know I did the right thing. I had no choice. It's just Joe and me now. Are we still going to Pops? That's the plan. Will Pop be okay? I hope so, son.